This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Hi, friends. If you're enjoying this series and you'd like to help me reach even more people with thinking faith, please consider supporting the show. Silver supporters get early access to episodes and bonus content. Gold supporters also get signed books and a monthly catch up with me. The links to support are with the show notes or visit justinbriley.com. Enjoy today's episode. You got in trouble for refusing to call trans men and women by their preferred personal pronouns. No, I want to ask. that's not actually true. I got in trouble because I said I would not follow the compelled speech dictates of the federal and provincial government. In early 2018, a video clip went viral on social media featuring a relatively unknown Canadian psychology professor being grilled by formidable British news anchor Cathy Newman on patriarchy, transgender and free speech. You cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Well, I'm, I'm very glad I put you on the spot. <laughs> well, well, I'm very glad that I have no, exercised my, my point. Speech. You get my point. It's like you're, you're doing what you should do, which is digging a bit to see what the hell's going on. So and that you, is what you should do. But you're you exercising think, your freedom of speech to certainly risk offending me. And that's fine. I think you, more power to you as far as I'm concerned. So you haven't sat there and... I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work that out. I mean... Ha, gotcha. You have got me. You have got me. I'm trying to work that through time. my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took a while. It took a while. It did, it did, yeah. Jordan B. Peterson was a psychology lecturer at the University of Toronto who, until 2016, was popular with his students but relatively unknown beyond the confines of academia. However, when Canada enshrined new laws which potentially criminalised anyone who refused to address transgender persons by their preferred pronouns, Peterson objected. His concerns, delivered via YouTube, led to student protests on the university campus. But Peterson was also drawing many young people, especially young men, to his message, not just about free speech, but on the search for purpose, meaning and identity. Like, as the prototypical 27-year-old directionless guy that stumbled onto your work, something in you spoke to something in me. You taught me the value of telling the truth and of being responsible and of doing what is right, not what is easy. It was like, um, it was like a pebble at the top of an intellectual awakening avalanche. It was like a, like a gateway drug to integrity. That viral Kathy Newman interview arguably launched Peterson from being a controversial academic with a cult following into widespread public consciousness. But who was this enigmatic new intellectual? Why was he proving so popular? And what exactly did he believe about God? I'm Justin Briley, and for over a decade and a half, I've been hosting conversations on faith between atheists, agnostics, and believers. In this documentary series, I'm telling the story of why new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. I'm speaking to those inside and outside the atheist movement and the many new thinkers beginning a new conversation on the value of faith. Along the way, we'll meet some of those who have found themselves surprised by God as they've made the journey from atheism to Christianity. In the coming three episodes of our second act, we'll be exploring the new conversation on God emerging among secular thinkers. Welcome to the surprising rebirth of belief in God, episode five, The Jordan Peterson Phenomenon. Well, 
Well, just before we get into the rest of today's show, someone we've heard from quite a bit on the podcast is author and speaker Glenn Scrivener. Hello, Glenn. Hey, Justin. Always great to be here. Well, for a while now, you've been happily pointing people to your online course, 321. Where did that come from? It's a passion of mine to help people get to grips with Christian faith and to do it in a way that's attractive and imaginative and deep and that assumes no prior knowledge. So 321 is my way of showing life according to Jesus. We want it to be a, a, like a mere Christianity for a digital age. Okay, so that sounds like it's maybe more for those who are not Christians. Well, yeah, many people have done it who are not Christians, and they've found faith for the first time. We're thrilled about that. But like with Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, Christians love that book too. And the first audience we have in mind for 3 to 1 is actually a Christian who wants to be refreshed in their faith and to have something to pass on to their Christian curious friends and family. Okay, so Christian or not, this basically gets people to the heart of the faith. Right. And nearly 10,000 people have joined the online platform. It's free. You watch these video-led sessions and you think through the stunning animations. You engage with the chat community. You get a ton of extra content thrown in. And now you have on your phone a mere Christianity that you can share with others. So the phrase we're using is you can share this without shame, without cost and without delay. Well, we've been really enjoying promoting 321 and listeners to this podcast can get into it instantly by going to 321course.com slash JB. That's 321course.com slash JB. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, thank you, Justin. Keep up the good work. Do you just tend to describe yourself as a religious man at all? Well, I would definitely describe myself as a religious man, yeah. I think that's fundamentally true. The, the devil's in the detail. So, uh, what does that mean exactly? In 2018, I had my own interview with Jordan Peterson on the big conversation from Premier Unbelievable. I've seen you been asked the question, do you believe in God? And that's not a question you necessarily find it terribly easy to, to answer. Well, I don't know what people mean when they say believe. Mm. Like it's, it's as if that question explains itself when it's asked. It's like it doesn't. What do you mean by believe? And what do you mean by God? And what makes you think that the question that I'm answering is the same one that you're asking? Mm. This is not something that you can say yes or no to in any straightforward manner. So I find it an off-putting question. And, and I don't think it's because I'm avoiding the issue. I, I think that to answer it properly requires books mm. and lectures. Like, yeah. And, yeah. And so, Do you see yourself at least in the Christi Christian tradition as far as your, I suppose, worldview? Well, there's no, well, there's no doubt about that because I'm a Westerner. There's, mm. there's no escape from that. Yeah. I'm conditioned in every cell to, from, as a consequence of the Judeo-Christian worldview. And so I, I've read a fair bit in other religious traditions and have a a reasonable grasp on some of them, I would say, not trying to overestimate my knowledge, um, but it, it, we're saturated in Judeo-Christian ethics, and so... I've seen you say that you certainly live your life as though God exists. Yes, I would say, well, to the best of my ability, hmm. right? Yeah, and I think that that's the fundamental hallmark of belief, is what you, it's how you act, not right. what you say about what you think you think. Sure. What do you know about what you think? My own encounter with Jordan Peterson took place while he was visiting the UK to promote a book, his recently published 12 Rules for Life. Ironically, my interview took place just a couple of days before he recorded that viral interview with Kathy Newman. But even when he joined me, he was already increasingly in demand. Numerous media outlets were vying for his time and two hastily booked lectures at a 1,000 seat London venue had sold out within hours. The events were packed out, not by crusty academics, but by young, mostly male professionals. Since that Kathy Newman moment, you haven't been able to escape Peterson. The original video, which currently stands at almost 50 million views, spawned a multitude of blogs, opinion pieces and interviews interrogating his newfound fame and the ideas he brings with him. Jordan Peterson, who is a uh, kind of understated uh, psychology professor from the University of Toronto, has emerged as one of the hottest personalities uh, on the internet. His new book, 12 Rules for Life, is number one bestseller pretty much all over the world. At the beginning of this year, you wrote this book, 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. And in the six or seven months since, around the world, it sold pretty much two million copies. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. Up on that. Yes. You have struck some sort of a chord. Why do you think that is? Because I'm having a serious conversation with my viewers and listeners and readers about 
how to structure their lives individually and the relationship between responsibility and meaning. Before his rise to global fame, Peterson had become notorious in his own country of Canada for his protest against compelled use of pronouns. University of Toronto psychology professor Jordan Peterson has a fight on his hands after objecting to proposed legislation that he says would violate his freedom of speech by forcing him to address transgendered people using the pronouns of their choosing. But the professor said it wasn't about being anti-transgender. His concern was about the state criminalizing the use of language, the first step towards an Orwellian-style tyranny in Peterson's eyes. But it seems to me that we're in danger of crossing the line. With Bill C-16 and its surrounding legislation, it's the first time I've seen in our legislative history where people are attempting to make us speak their language. Because what I saw in that legislation was a a sin against logos, like it was a crime against free speech. So there was a, there was legally inappropriate, it was philosophically inappropriate, but it was inappropriate all the way down. Do not constrain people's conscience. It's expressed in their voluntary dialogue. You're messing around with their soul. It's like you don't get to do that. Yet, while his political and social values may be anti-woke, Peterson has always disavowed any association with the fascism of the alt-right. He says he's defending classic liberal values of academic liberty and freedom of speech, but sees the growing popularity of identity politics among groups defining themselves by sexuality, gender and race as a form of cultural Marxism. Battling political correctness may have earned Peterson an audience, but his continuing connection with his young, meaning-seeking audience still needs explanation. Perhaps the greatest mystery of all is his admiration for the power of religion and his endless fascination with the Bible. Any reader expecting a secular approach to psychology in his best-selling book, 12 Rules for Life, would have been surprised by Peterson's constant references to the Bible and Christian beliefs in the search for meaning and purpose in life. Here's Bishop Robert Barron speaking at the time of the publication of the book. Uh, the new book I just finished reading, uh, 12 Rules for Life, uh, makes for a, a pretty bracing and satisfying reading, I think. It's a someone assuming the mantle, I would say, of, of spiritual father. And he's speaking, I think, especially to younger people about, you know, rules. Life is not just a matter of, of you know, self-expression, and I, I make it up as I go along, but there are these rules that are grounded in our psychological and physical structure that you can see up and down the centuries of the tradition. And Peterson kind of moves boldly into that space of, of spiritual teacher. One of the core messages of your book is that we underestimate the power and the relevance and the importance of uh, old stories and myths, including the Christian Bible. This is Peterson being interviewed on the BBC's Hard Talk show. And you, I think, would then say many people in academia today who are into uh, sort of constructivism and relativism are missing the truth of old verities. Would, would you agree yes, with that? Yes, I would that? say that's definitely a theme that runs through the book, is that there's wisdom in traditional stories that we need to understand, not merely believe, but also to understand. And so, for example, last year I did a series of 15 lectures on Genesis, right? And most of that audience was young men, and that's been viewed by millions of people online now. Peterson had also engaged the Bible in a set of long-form lectures on the book of Genesis that had become, to his own great surprise, very popular. Paul Vanderclay is a pastor whose own YouTube channel started to flourish as he began charting the spiritual influence of the psychologist from an early stage. I, I think I was reading Rod Dreer's blog, and he had mentioned this Canadian psychologist who got in trouble with pronouns, and I don't think I paid any attention then. But then when he started doing this biblical series, I thought, what is this? Well, thank you all very much for coming. It's really shocking to me that you don't have anything better to do on a Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, though, it, it is. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange in some sense that 
There's so many of you here to listen to a sequence of, psych of lectures on the psychological significance of the biblical stories. It isn't something I've wanted to do for a long time, but we'll see how it goes. And I thought, you know, some of my good friends who are really wonderful preachers in Toronto are preaching to half empty buildings. And here's this psychologist who is people are paying, you know, 30, 40 bucks a seat traveling all over the world to hear him, you know, not have some little 20, 30 minute homily on the Bible, but two plus hours of rambling thoughts. And so I started listening to him and I thought, oh, this is nothing like I've really ever heard before. We don't know who we are, or what we are, or where we came from, or any of those things. And, you know, the light life is an unbroken chain going back three and a half billion years. It's an absolutely unbelievable thing. Every single one of your ancestors reproduced successfully for three and a half billion years. It's absolutely unbelievable. And we rose out of the dirt and the muck, and here we are, conscious but not knowing, and we're trying to figure out who we are. And a story that we've been telling, or a set of stories that we've been telling for 3,000 years seems to me to have something to offer. And so when, when I look at the stories in the Bible, I do it, I would say in some sense with a beginner's mind, it's, it's a mystery, this book, how the hell it was made, why it was made, why we preserved it, how it happened to motivate an entire culture for 2,000 years and to transform the world. Like what's going on? How did that happen? It's by no means obvious. And one of the things that bothers me about casual critics of religion is that they don't take the phenomena seriously, and it's a serious phenomenon. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of all of this was that the audience turning out for Peterson were rather similar to those who had once turned out for the New Atheist conferences and events several years earlier. Young people looking for intelligent discourse on science, philosophy, meaning and purpose in life. Peterson seemed to tick the box of being a scientifically savvy intellectual, frequently referencing the socio-evolutionary aspects of psychology and culture. But rather than dismiss God and religion, as the new atheist had, he was instead pointing people back to the Bible as a deep source of meaning too, often interpreted through the symbolic lens of his own Jungian psychology. Paul van der Klee. People began to say, there's a credibility to the Bible that I never would have imagined. And I was watching all this happen on YouTube and I thought, well, I'll just make a little video. And so I made a little video and I didn't understand what social media could do and what the algorithm could do. And suddenly there were a lot more people um, listening to my video and then wanting to talk to me. You know, Jordan was interesting in and of himself, but what really fascinated me was the response he was eliciting. And one of the early comments that caught my eye on Reddit or in a comment section somewhere was um, people had mentioned, yeah, they had they had had an interest in Tim Keller about 10 years before, but wow, Jordan Peterson really has their interest. And and I began noticing people who had were fans of Sam Harris and New Atheist or had um, become fascinated by New Age um, ideas and had left the church and then people becoming interested again in church. That fascinated me. I thought, what is happening with this? I too was hearing many reports of Peterson inspiring many people, especially young men, with a sense of stability, order and meaning in their lives. Anecdotes abounded of people coming up to Peterson at his events and even on the street to tell him that his message had changed their lives for the better. And as this interview with Nihal Arthanayaka on BBC Radio 5 Live shows, he wasn't afraid to get emotional when talking about it. I read a fascinating interview with you and you were talking about the plight of young men and how guys really need to get their act together. At this show we've covered widely the fact that suicide is the biggest killer of young men under the age of 45 in this country. It goes on in that interview to say, at this point, to my astonishment, Peterson begins to weep. He yeah, well, it says, see now, it did it to me again. Look, last night, you know, I was at this 
talk I gave, and about a thousand people came, and about 500 of them stayed afterwards, and most of them were young men, you know, and just one of them after the other comes up to me, and they shake my hand, and they say, look, I've been listening to what you've been saying for six months, and it's changed my life. It's like I was depressed. I was addicted to drugs. Uh, my relationships weren't working out. I was hopeless. I didn't have any goal. I started cleaning up my room and telling the truth and working hard on myself, and it's really working, and I just want to thank you for helping me. And I thank God, it's so, it's so sad that so many of these men, you know, they've not had an encouraging bloody word, a real encouraging word in their entire life. It just takes a little bit of, of encouragement and care so that they're willing to set themselves straight to some degree and start trying. It's just a catastrophe that that's, that's so rare in their lives. Jordan was able, I think, especially to inspire a generation of men who felt blamed maybe for historical evils and and encourage them to to not sort of um, avoid and hide away from the challenges of their life, but to face them head on and to really engage them. And, and when people would do that, they found their lives got better. They had more friends. Um, they potentially could, you know, attract the interest of of a young woman perhaps and 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 this for people this for a generation of young men was just i mean it was just potent and they took next steps and they got good results and so they wanted more and you know as jordan has said many times bishop Barron noticed noted this too in his conversations with jordan he challenged men in a way that men, a lot of men, at least outside the church, weren't being challenged. I think in all fairness, a, a number of Christian ministries had been doing that. A generation before Promise Keepers was, was doing some similar mm. things. But Jordan was able to do this in a way that people who had sort of written off the church or wouldn't come near the church said, hmm, maybe there's something to God and the Bible. It wasn't only a sense of order and responsibility that Peterson seemed to be injecting into the lives of these young men. Many seemed to be giving religion, specifically Christianity, a second look as they heard him speak on the deep patterns of meaning in the Bible and its archetypal figure of heroism and sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Oliver Murray is currently an ordinand for ministry in the Anglican Church, but grew up without going to church and without any religious convictions of his own. He told me how it was encountering Jordan Peterson's thinking that made him pick up a Bible and read the Gospels. See, I think the figure of, of Jesus is incredibly appealing. Uh, you know, it's we, we still live in this culture that's obsessed with, you know, the saviour, the self-sacrificing hero. You know, who's resurrected and who can't be defeated. So I think what Jordan did for me was he really brought this sense of the existence of evil and a sense of we all know that the world perhaps isn't as it should be. And so he was addressing, in a way, the fall. Um, and so from there, I suppose... I was able to say, okay, these stories, let's take Genesis, for example, um, have a tremendous power and value to them. And I don't use story in a pejorative sense. They seem to record something that's happening or something that happened and, and actually is happening all, all the time. We, you know, we, we all sort of miss the mark. We all, we all fall short of, uh, of, of perhaps what we're aiming for. Um, and so he was able to say, look at the symbolic power within these stories. Look at the snake in the garden. Um, you know this 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 force that's what, that wants to lead you astray. Let's say using sort of cultural language there, um, and he suddenly breathed life life into it, and he, and he and he made me realize, okay, there's something here which I hadn't seen. I I I don't I I think it's very difficult for someone who's not a Christian to say just read through Genesis and to take much from it. Um, you know, we're we're sort of wrestling with how to understand these stories today in the West with this kind of reductive materialism. Um, and Peterson was able to say, there is treasure here, you know, if you know how to read it. And of course, I say now I'm, I'm a, I am a Christian, um, and he's, he was doing it in a kind of Jungian way, which is, which is not quite maybe there, but, but he was building 
bridges. He certainly built the yeah. bridge for me. You'll hear more of Oliver's story in a future edition of the podcast. But what was the gospel that Peterson was bringing to his audience? And what did he actually believe about God himself? Peterson was openly critical of atheists such as Richard Dawkins, saying that their anti-religious polemic wouldn't help anyone to actually live in the real world. But as I'd experienced, his own beliefs about God were often difficult to pin down. He would frequently apply the Jungian language of value hierarchy to God, saying whatever is at the top of that hierarchy of values serves the function of God for you. Others too have noted that there was still a gap between Peterson's psychological approach to the Bible and Orthodox Christian faith. Bishop Barron. He's reading the great religious text through the, the lenses of that archetypal psychology, and he uncovers great truth, and I, I applaud that. But what worries me a bit is what worried me about Joseph Campbell, what worried me about C.G. Jung, whom I read years ago with great interest. But it's, I'll call it the Gnosticizing tendency. That's to say a tendency to bracket historicity and to uncover the sort of secret or hidden wisdom in these texts. Now whether you do it philosophically as the ancient Gnostics did, or you do it more psychologically as Jung and Campbell and, and Peterson do, uh, the danger is a bracketing of the historical referent in these biblical texts. Now this would take you know another 12 videos adequately to to get into, but it matters immensely for Christian theology that certain things happened, that Jesus really is the incarnation of the Logos. It's not just an archetypal story full of wise uh, patterns of meaning, but that God really became one of us, that God really died on the cross, and that Jesus rose from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are not just uh, archetypal symbols, those are, are facts of, of history. Peterson's popularity was fast eclipsing that of his new atheist peers, and his growing platform would mean him coming into conversation with many of them. One of the most notable was a series of four arena debates with one of New Atheism's best-known advocates, Sam Harris, who was keen to hold Peterson's feet to the fire on what he really believed about the Bible. If you're in a parish of one, yeah. or in a parish of 1,000, or a parish of 100,000, but not in the parish that has anything in common with the, with the Bible thumpers in my country who think that Jesus is very likely coming back in their lifetime because he never died, and he's gonna judge the living and the dead, and there'll be a resurrection and hellfire and all the rest. If that's not the game you're playing at all, own it. Why, why, are you, why, are you, why are you all applauding about that? It's like, what, what do you mean own it? It's like, I already made my claim. It's like, I'm not playing a religious fundamentalist game. So what's all the applause about? So I don't understand that. And own it, it's like, I was as, listen, I was as clear as I possibly could be when I delineated my answer to the question, people say, well, what do you mean by God? So, someone like, once, someone once one, asked you if Jesus you was resurrected. You want a one second answer? But no. Well, forget it, man. So George, George, I think George can, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. I think we can actually. This is a what, complicated what, what, One problem. second. No, I, yeah. I don't want to end on a, I don't want to end on a note of acrimony, but someone once asked you whether you thought Jesus was literally resurrected, and you said it would take me 40 hours to answer that question. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I'm responding to here. You don't need to do that if you have a clear-cut answer to that question. And I don't you, have a clear-cut answer and to that question. And if you don't, and if you don't, that, that connects with many other things that we still have to talk about. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I definitely. Mean, because, because that... It isn't and, obvious in the biblical account that Christ was literally resurrected. So it's not no. simple. This no, is not no, no, simple. No, no, it, no. But if the question is, do you think he? Well, let's let's put it probabilistically. I mean, anything's possible. I'll tell you that it's possible that he was physically resurrected. I mean, it's it's not. It's even possible. Wait a second. I didn't with respect say to quantum that he mechanics. Was. The point is, if, I said it, it would take me forty hours to answer the question. I didn't say that he was. Well, we'll go ahead. Well, how's this for an answer? Almost certainly not. 
Blogger Bethel McGrew covered the Peterson-Harris debates as they happened. So I wrote an analysis piece for Pathios that went viral and really sort of launched me as a writer in this space. And I called it Sam Harris Asks Questions Jordan Peterson Can't Answer. And I still think that's a pretty good summation of those debates. I, I came away thinking that they were a messy draw, in essence. I didn't think either Peterson or Harris really emerged clearly victorious because both of them had real holes to poke in each other's positions. You had Peterson with a much deeper understanding of human nature, free will, the moral landscape, all these areas where Harris has written books, he thinks he has a good framework, when in fact, it's just spectacularly inadequate for sustaining a serious discussion. So this this is, I think, Peterson's great strength, his strength as a psychologist who fundamentally understands how people tick and what people need. And so he brought that to the table. But then on the other hand, you had Harris rightly challenging Peterson's philosophical pragmatism, the idea that it doesn't really matter whether something like Jesus' resurrection actually happened, as long as believing in the resurrection gets Western civilization through the night, so to speak. Harris kept coming back and saying, no, actually, it does matter because it matters whether or not people are believing true things. And so I found myself strangely agreeing with Harris in those moments because I agree with him about what the questions are, even though we would give opposite answers. And I think Peterson struggled to answer those questions clearly for his part because he struggled to understand why they were even important. And that's a function of his pragmatic approach, his Jungian approach, which really is kind of orthogonal to the whole Christian atheist debate as Harris was used to approaching it. It's a way of trying to sidestep or transcend the old debate altogether. And I think at the end, Harris is right that you can't do that. You still need to have the debate. Jordan, he understood people had a deep desire to live within a story. Paul van der Klee. And Sam in those debates was just sort of tone deaf. I, especially the first debate, not a lot happened in the second and third and fourth uh, debate. But in the, in the first one, especially you could see Jordan trying to engage with Sam and saying, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can sort of come to some agreement and build something together. And Sam at that point was, no, I'm just interested in you know, not kicking the legs out under Christianity. And now, of course, Sam is, and many other new atheists, far less interested in sort of kicking the slats out from under the church and more interested in, in giving people meaning. So, you know, Jordan really got there first and Sam sort of now looks like someone who's sort of partially reconstructed. Then, at the end of 2019, almost as suddenly as he had arisen, Jordan Peterson disappeared from the public eye. We're learning new details this morning about the physical state of controversial psychologist and author Jordan Peterson. His family says he's in Russia undergoing what they describe as, quote, an emergency detox. A combination of a grueling schedule, his wife Tammy's shock cancer diagnosis, and an unwitting addiction to anti-anxiety medication suddenly left him a shadow of his former self. Dad was put on a low dose of a benzodiazepine a few years ago for anxiety following an extremely severe autoimmune reaction to food. He took the medication as prescribed. Last April, when my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer, the dose of the medication was increased. It became apparent that he was suffering from both a physical dependency and a paradoxical reaction to the medication. For the last eight months, he's been in unbearable discomfort from this drug, made worse when trying to remove it because of the additional withdrawal symptoms stemming from physical dependence. Gradually, over the course of a year from hell, with the help of his daughter, Michaela, he was able to detox from the medication and build his strength back again. As some of you may know, but others will not, it's been a long while since I put up any new content on this YouTube channel. I've been suffering from impaired health, severely impaired health, but I'm alive and I have plans for the future. With God's grace and mercy, um, I'll be able to start generating original material once again and 
pick up where I left off. Um, thank you very much. Well, thanks for thanks for being here. It's been a hell of a year. Thanks for your help, too. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to give up. When Peterson returned in 2021, he seemed to do so with a new sense of purpose, a, a calling, if you will, that was ever more inspired by Christian faith. Yes, still infused with Jungian psychology, but in this interview with Eastern Orthodox thinker Jonathan Peugeot, he once again became emotional as he described the way in which Christ seemed to bring together the world of myth and meaning and morality with the real world of history and objective fact. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth. And in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen. Sometimes. The objective world and the narrative world touch, you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. Thanks to Gareth, who wrote in to say, whether you're a person of faith, agnostic, atheist or none of the above, this series is both genuinely thought provoking and inspiring. I could not recommend it highly enough. Leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts or simply posting about us on your social media helps others to discover the show. If you want to follow more of my work, why not get my fortnightly newsletter? I'll even send you the first chapter of The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God book for free when you subscribe. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get early access episodes and bonus content. Gold supporters will receive signed copies of both my books. For the newsletter and to support, visit justinbriley.com or the links with today's show. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Since his return to public life, Jordan Peterson has continued to work out his own faith in public and still before large crowds of thousands of people. I was one among over 12,000 who saw him speak this autumn at London's O2 Arena, along with other conservative-leaning religious and non-religious thinkers. The key difference compared to the debates I witnessed among the new atheists 15 years ago is that God and faith are firmly back on the table in these conversations as a credible source of meaning and value. Why so? 
Well, I believe Peterson has understood, like many psychologists, that people need a story to live by, and that until relatively recently, the story that shaped people's lives was the Christian story, a narrative about reality with a clear beginning, present, and future. It could be summarized in four acts. Creation. In the beginning, God created everything good. Fall. But things went badly wrong and people went their own way. God's rescue project for his creation involved coming in person to save it. Redemption. Jesus lived the life that you and I had failed to live and in his death mysteriously bore the consequences of all our failures. New creation. Now each person was invited to step into a future that was defined by the hope of his resurrection and a new world to come. At a simple level, that story involved several key assumptions. Each human life was here by design rather than by accident. Every life, whether male or female, was created in the image of God and therefore has value. Evil and suffering were a fact of our present existence, but would one day be vanquished when justice was done in the world. And every person, whatever their profession, background or station in life, was called to work towards creating a world shaped by the teachings and character of Jesus. Now, doubtless, the story was often abused by Christendom's gatekeepers or used as an opium of the masses, as Karl Marx described it. Yet, for all its faults, that grand story of creation, fall, redemption and new creation helped to frame people's day-to-day -day existence for centuries. The idea that each individual life was intended by God gave meaning to each individual's existence, that their troubles and afflictions had been the lot of Christ himself gave people the fortitude to bear their own suffering and see it in the context of a greater God-given purpose. Indeed, being part of a story that was cosmic in scale meant the most humble denizen of Earth could yet be imbued with a sense of ultimate purpose. As the 17th century poet George Herbert wrote, a servant with this clause makes drudgery divine. It's difficult to exaggerate the psychological difference that such a view made to the culture that fostered it. The narrative of Christianity gave people a story to be part of. But as that story has faded in our communal consciousness, a shared existential question has come to replace it. What story are we now supposed to live by? One of the major messages of Peterson and increasingly many like-minded secular thinkers is that atheist materialism, with its promise of science and technology as a savior for the world, has failed to give us a story that we can make sense of life by. No, it, it, it's not a motivating ethos, atheism. And you might say, well, that doesn't matter because it's still true. It's like, well, yeah, fair enough in some sense, but it is crucial because people do need to be motivated. And so that gap, and, and Harris himself has said, well, atheism is fundamentally a doctrine of negation. All it states is there is no God. It's like, okay, fine, well, what do we do from there? Well, then, then the story gets less compelling. And so I can see it as something that's, well, it's got a destructive element, which of course is something that Nietzsche pointed out when he discussed the death of God. He said, we'll never find enough water essentially to wash away the blood, right? So you lose something like that. You lose the motivating ethos of your community. And you might say, well, that's okay because we've replaced it with objective truth. And look, fair enough, man. Objective truth is what's provided us with this incredible technological power. And you have to be a fool not to see that as an advantage. But, but it's, it's, it's in an insufficient account in my estimation. Peterson was a humanist in the good sense. Bethel McGrew. In the sense that he, he perceived that human beings are intrinsically valuable. Um, that human lives are intrinsically meaningful. He explicitly brought out the fact that that's a Judeo-Christian idea, which means that you can't just go into the operating system of Western civilization and delete the code for Christianity or delete the code for Judaism. That's what the new atheists wanted to do. They said, this is Bronze Age nonsense. Why don't we just delete the code? Why don't we just not down the fence? So Chesterton's fence is a fence that you come upon and you're not sure why it's there, 
but you shouldn't just knock it down because it might have a purpose that you don't fully understand. And that was Peterson's message. Um, he's saying it's not necessarily that these stories actually happened at a point in time in history. It's not that they're true in that sense necessarily. It's that people need them to be true. And civilization in some sense was built on the belief that they were true. So um, if you just delete that code, then you don't really understand what you might unleash. And so don't knock down the fence. That was that was Peterson's message. Barry Weiss is another intellectual peer of Peterson who has been on her own journey of coming to appreciate her own Jewish cultural and spiritual heritage in a new way in recent years. Weiss came to Y prominence in 2020 when she resigned her position as op-ed writer at the New York Times in protest at the curtailment of free thought within her profession. The journalist has described herself as liberal and centre-left, but found herself increasingly out of step with her progressive peers at the paper. In this interview with Peterson, she spoke about the way New Atheism, by seeking to eradicate the Judeo-Christian narrative, cleared the way for all kinds of other stories and ideologies to take its place. There is a reckoning that that needs to be had with, you know, the New Atheists or what was called the New Atheists. So why do you say that? Well, only because one, th well, let, let me back up into it this way. When I look at the qualities of the people who have the strength and the fortitude to not go along with the crowd and to be willing to be slandered and to sacrifice for the sake of resisting this illiberalism, almost all of them are religious in some way or another. Almost all of them were deeply, deeply anchored, I would say, to I don't want to say spirituality, but like local something deeper is rooting mm -hmm. them. That's what and, Solzhenitsyn said against the, about the people he met in the Gulag who could who could stand up to the to the to the Soviets. And I think that's the thing I'm finding again and again now as I'm sort of making my way through all of these different sectors of life, reporting on the spread of this ideology. Who's willing to talk to me? Who's willing to speak up? Um, and one of the things that I don't necessarily think that that the atheist group, you know, who I admire on a lot of levels that they maybe couldn't have foreseen is that robbing people of that religious impulse both sort of soften the ground for the rise of this deeply illiberal ideology that functions in many ways like a new religion and also ham like it just deprive it, it, it in a way it's deeply connected i think to the rise of this new orthodoxy Douglas Murray is another influential and conservative thinker who's worried, even as a non-believer, about the lack of a unifying story in our culture. Something incredibly deep has happened underneath our societies, which we're in, if not in denial about, we don't face up to, which is we're, we're living at a stage where we might be among the first people in human history to have absolutely no explanation for what we're doing here. And no story to tell about what we should do. Bethel McGrew. Murray shares some of Peterson's wisdom in assessing where new, new atheism has failed, what questions it hasn't addressed. I'm thinking of a passage where Murray quotes Dawkins on all the things science has solved. And he says, that's really not true to the human experience because we don't feel solved. We don't go through our lives as solved beings. So, Dawkins will come along and say, well, that's it. Just pack it in, guys. Science has solved everything. And Murray is going to say, actually, no, not really. There's all this work that still lies ahead of you. Again, like Peterson, Murray is the good kind of humanist. Um, he, he recognizes that it's a terrifying thing to have sawn off the branch that we're sitting on because it leaves the question of human value in a very vulnerable place. Um, because he looks around and he sees that the strongest 
clearest voices speaking out on things like abortion or euthanasia or assisted suicide, the strongest voices speaking out about these things are Christians. Paul van der Klee says that the loss of the Christian story in favor of a materialist story of reality has gone deep. 20th and 21st century, especially in my Reformed background, we usually have a creation, fall, redemption, restoration narrative that uh, people would follow. And I think part of why that story has lost, or that, not necessarily the story, but the formulation of the story I mean, that's in some ways sort of an epigenetics that we, that's an interpretive lens through which we read the Bible. I think the Darwinian narrative undermined especially the the good creation element because the Darwinian story was that it's always, nature has always been read in tooth and claw. And this is the, this is the, the combat that we are born to. Being itself is either neutral or evil. If you don't finally deconstruct this mechanistic story that says we are simply a product of of chaos and physics, I don't know that you'll actually find narrative finally as satisfying as it could be. And I think it's exactly for that reason that Jordan just keeps reading the Bible and talking about it publicly and he's He's too fascinated to let it go. And I think many, many other people will have exactly that same experience. How that will all play out, I'm not, I don't know that any of us can see, but it's happening. In next week's edition of the podcast, we'll explore how deeply the loss of the Christian story is being felt in our culture today and the contemporary stories people are turning to in an attempt to replace it. And regardless of where Peterson himself has landed in terms of personal belief in God, he has certainly put religion and God talk back on the table in meaningful ways. John McRae, whose popular YouTube channel, What Do You Mean, documents the latest cultural trends, says he noticed the difference as soon as Jordan Peterson's lectures on the Bible began trending online. Really, um, you know, they were like, oh, you know, this is amazing. And I never thought that there was this kind of insight in the Bible. And so because of that, people really started softening up because Jordan Peterson, again, was giving them a way to find meaning and purpose through the Bible. And so he's showing them that there's something beyond that you can get from the Bible that you can't get from the materialistic atheist world. And so because of that, um, I think he really helped to kind of shape because you see a lot of thinkers followed Peterson as well after his his thinking on this. Um, We saw Joe Rogan, his tone changed completely towards religion and Christianity um, after having Jordan Peterson on this podcast. um, It changed significantly because he was very hostile. He was like the newer atheist, the new atheist and the newer atheist. Um, And he was like them. And then he changed his tone after um, having Jordan Peterson on there. And the same was true for um, uh, Dave Rubin. Um, He was an atheist who changed his mind um, because of Jordan Peterson. And so it just kind of kept going on and on. And I think that that's what really caused um, a significant um, a significant change in the, the social landscape when it comes to talk and uh, religion and Christianity online. Journalist Ben Sixsmith agrees. If in 2008 you were saying, oh yeah, you know, in 10 years time, maybe the biggest online intellectual figure is going to be delivering lectures about the Bible, it would have been completely mind blown because the exact opposite was the case. All the popular online intellectual figures were talking about how insane it was to believe that there was a God. And obviously Jordan Peterson has not claimed to believe in God, but he was looking into the value of religion um, as a historical force, as a cultural force, as something that can give meaning to life, whether or not you take uh, his truth claims seriously. And that was just an extraordinary cultural shift. And I'm sure it taps into that sense that, uh, that the modern loneliness and the modern kind of alienation needed a different uh, kind of philosophical and spiritual, however you take spiritual to mean course. And I, yeah, I think that's kind of not to say that everyone's been inspired by Jordan Peterson, but I think we're kind of in the, w- within the ripples of that phenomenon. Uh, a lot of other thinkers have been experiencing the same kind of existential and political dissatisfaction 
with the world that from which new atheism emerged and they've been turning back to kind of older traditions and older ways of life and thinking what kind of wisdom can we extract from these texts or from these uh, conversations. But was this new appreciation for the stability and meaning that religious tradition affords actually leading people to convert? I asked Ben. Respect can be, it can open the door to belief. You know, if I look at the outside of a building and I think, wow, that's nice. I'm I'm going to want to look in. So that can certainly be the case. Um, and so it does have value in that sense. Um, but how, how many people have done that would be an interesting question, and I'm sure one that could be studied. Um, I think there's been an enormously significant trickle-down effect from Peterson's work. I've seen it myself. I've talked to people who will tell you they're Christians today because of Peterson. Bethel McGrew. But it's ironic in a way that here you have this this guy who can't step over the threshold himself, but because of the way that he spoke about Christianity, the way that he got people to think outside of the box, the way he shook them up, he nudged them along down a pathway that he couldn't take so that they've now gone farther along the journey to faith than he has. Um, so again, we shouldn't overestimate the effect that that can have. And specifically, the effect that it has to hear Christianity taken seriously in the voice of an outsider. Um, you know, it's like if, you know, if your mom tells you to clean your room, well, that's just mom. Of course, mom is going to tell you to clean your room. But if Jordan Peterson tells you to clean your room, oh, wow, I never thought about that before. So... You know, that Jordan Peterson telling you to clean your room has a has a deeper manifestation in Jordan Peterson telling you to read your Bible. Your pastor tells you to read your Bible. Well, that's your pastor's job. Peterson tells you to read your Bible. Wow, well, maybe maybe I really should read my Bible. Maybe there's actually something something serious here. Um, so that was the effect that Peterson had for so many people. And it was a very powerful thing and a very real thing, I think. I had certainly also come across a number of stories of people who had either shed their atheism as a result of Peterson's influence, or even walked through the door to Christian faith. Peterson's popular psychological approach to scripture, combined with taking people's existential questions seriously, indeed so seriously they frequently made him weep, was intensely attractive to many people. For some, Peterson was, as one person put it, a gateway drug to Christianity. Personally, I was grateful that the conversation seemed to be changing so dramatically. The back and forths between Christian apologists and new atheists on the philosophical and scientific evidence for God served an important purpose, but could often appear stale and abstract to the average person. When Peterson showed up, the question of God seemed to be speaking more directly to people's deepest longings, emotions, and their desire to live in a more meaningful story. When he joined me on Premier Unbelievable's Big Conversation show to discuss the question of whether we can make sense of life without God, opposite atheist psychologist Susan Blackmore, you could have been forgiven for thinking Peterson was a Christian apologist. So fervently did he defend the idea that humans are made in the image of God and are made to pursue a divine logos. Significantly, however, during his debate with Blackmore, Peterson issued a warning. As the Christian story has faded in the West, atheism has failed to provide a meaningful ethic to replace it. The 19th century philosopher Frederick Nietzsche's dire warnings about the consequences of the death of God in the West would be felt soon enough. Because Nietzsche knew perfectly well that when you pull the cornerstone out from underneath a building, that even though it may stay aloft in midair like a cartoon character that's wandered off a cliff for some period of time, that it will inevitably crumble Mm. and that it will be replaced by something that's perhaps far worse. Now, Nietzsche hoped it it would be replaced by man's ability to recreate meaning spontaneously out of his psyche, for example, which I think is a doomed enterprise. But he knew that in the interval, it would be replaced by both nihilism and by communist totalitarianism, which is a hell of a prediction because it 
it was done like 40 years before the events actually unfolded. Well, so, you, you can you, you can see it that way, but if that is the case, why do we have evidence that the most um, dysfunctional societies have higher proclaimed belief, higher attendance in church and so on? Now, this doesn't fit with what you were saying. Now, Nietzsche's ideas are very profound and interesting, but I just want to stop you from saying that he was absolutely right about somehow if, if we get rid of God, we're going to be worse because we have very well-functioning societies well, we in were Scandinavia, pretty, We were pretty example. bad in the 20th century. Oh, we were, yes, yes. people were. And, but, and, we, and we could easily drift that way again. And there have been terrible bad things to done in the name of God, and there have been terrible bad things done in the name of communism and, 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 and atheism. I don't think we can... I so don't you, want to uh, don't weigh them the up. God, the God. I'll weigh them up. You'll weigh, weigh them, them up and you'll no say... Problem. No problem. But then Let's you give, have to give, go against this evidence that well, I've well, just give, stated. Jordan, come back on this evidence. I mean, obviously, from her perspective, Sue feels like, actually, we've, we've got pretty stable societies that are increasingly secular these days. So... Perhaps Nietzsche was wrong, and in fact, we're not going to see this. Moral, well, I would say they're, they're stable to the degree that they're actually not secular. And uh, this is also a Nietzschean observation, and a Dostoevskian observation for that matter, is that we're living on the corpse of our ancestors, like we always have. That's a very old idea. But that, run, you, that runs, that stops being nourishing and starts to become rotten unless you replenish it. And I don't think we are replenishing it. We're in danger of running, we're living on borrowed time and in danger of running out of it. Jordan Peterson has been a fascinating character to me, one who is on the one hand often a controversial, sometimes divisive character in terms of his political and social views, yet undeniably someone who takes people's deepest questions of meaning and purpose very seriously. Now, I'm under no illusion that Jordan Peterson is the saviour of Christianity or the West. As far as Christians are concerned, that job is already taken. But I have personally found his analysis of the West's prosperity flowing from its Judeo-Christian inheritance a convincing one, reinforced by many other secular intellectuals coming to similar conclusions. And I found his focus on faith as a means of rediscovering meaning, purpose and identity encouraging, creating a new conversation on God that it turned out people were eager to hear. Peterson himself has evidently been on a personal journey with faith and has surrounded himself with many notable Christian thinkers. Meanwhile, his wife Tammy and daughter Michaela have both come to a commitment to Christian faith. It feels like the net may be closing in, but the God of Jordan Peterson still sometimes feels somewhat abstract to me. As Peterson himself said, the devil is in the details. Is there really a God beyond time and space who has been made known to us in the person of Jesus Christ and therefore demands the response of our whole lives? Or is God the uppermost ideal in our hierarchy of values? There is a difference. Peterson's main interpreter of scripture is the psychologist Carl Jung rather than the Holy Spirit, and that also matters in the end. Likewise, I resonate strongly with Peterson's fears for the future of the West in the absence of a unifying Christian story. But I don't believe Christianity is merely a useful social construct, metaphorically true because it works. I believe it works because it is literally true. And the only way we will nourish the values and ideals it has gifted us again is by discovering that good, beautiful and true story and living within it once more. You've been listening to The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, telling the story of how new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. This podcast series is also a book. You can read the first chapter for free when you join my newsletter at justinbriley.com, where you can also order the book or get a signed copy. Patreon supporters get early access to new episodes of this podcast plus bonus content. Find out more and about other ways to support this show at justinbriley.com. Material from The Big Conversation was used by kind permission of Premier. Visit premierunbelievable.com for full episodes. Coming up next time. From across the United Kingdom and around the globe, they came and they waited and they queued. All for this, a fleeting but significant moment. A chance to say goodbye, not just to a monarch, but to a woman who meant so much to so many. 
the meaning crisis, and why we're still all religious deep down. Today's episode was a production of Think Faith in partnership with Genexis and with support from the Jerusalem Trust and Christian Evidence Society. Editing assistance by Isaac Simmons, music by Epidemic Sound. You can find links to the book and all our featured guests with the show notes. Finally, please do subscribe to this podcast. Do rate and review us too. It really helps others to discover this new documentary series. Plus, you can get the next episode a week early when you support at justinbriley.com. The link is with today's show. See you next time. Thanks for listening today and to Ellis, who left this review saying one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Historical, insightful, reasoned and full of heart. So necessary in a culture that has forgotten why it is like it is. Just bought the book too. If you can leave a review, it helps others to discover the show. And if you want to buy the book like Ellis did, you can get a signed copy from my website. As it happens, gold supporters of this show get signed editions of both my books anyway, plus lots of bonus content and early access. And of course, your support makes a huge difference to me being able to produce this podcast. So for the book or to support, visit justinbriley.com or follow the links with the show notes.